I want to talk about antimatter, which is like normal matter, but with opposite charge. So if you take a normal particle that you know and love and you're familiar with, so familiar with, you're literally made out of it, and you take all its same properties, its mass, its, its spin, just everything is exactly the same except its charge, and you flip it, it's antimatter. And we, we describe processes in interacting with antimatter of how antimatter is created and how antimatter can be destroyed. And you can convert, say, energy into mass, you know, e equals mc squared. So you can convert energy into matter and antimatter. You can convert matter and antimatter back into energy. And a very common scenario that we like to toss around is that if you have a, a high energy bit of light, a photon, a super high energy, like an ultra high energy gamma ray or something, it can spontaneously just mining as much as wiggle along. This is a photon, I guess, wiggling along, being a gamma ray, and then it can disappear and be replaced by a pair by an electron and its antimatter counterpart, the positron. Like literally, this just happens in the universe all the time. There's high energy photon, just now you have a positron and electron, poof, out of the vacuum. They do things, they live their lives, and then they come back and they annihilate. And they're gone and then the, the bit of light returns. So matter and antimatter are created in pairs. And then they're destroyed. They're annihilated in pairs. They're completely obliterated and back into energy. So why? Why does antimatter always come paired up with matter? Why, is, why are they always symmetric like that? Why do we tell stories like that? Why don't we tell stories where like there's a bit of light and, and two electrons and one positron come out or, or four electrons and 15 positrons. I don't have 15 fingers, but you can imagine uh, come out. Like, why don't we tell stories like that? Now, there's very fundamental physics that dig into this and why, but instead I want to, I want to peel back and give you a visual metaphor. This visual metaphor for ex in understanding the symmetry between matter and antimatter comes from the guy who discovered antimatter. And antimatter was not discovered in a laboratory. It was not manufactured in an experiment. It was discovered by the power of thought, which I think is always pretty cool. The guy who discovered antimatter was uh, Paul Adrian Maurice Dirac, one of the greatest physicists, mathematical physicists ever, like seriously giving Einstein a run for his money and probably beating him in a few cases. Early 20th century, brilliant guy, discovered all sorts, like a founding, founding figure in quantum mechanics. And he discovered that antimatter exists. Like, popped out of the equation, you know, doing math. You know, imagine you're doing homework one day. You know, oh, antimatter. And then they went on to find it in the lab, and it was all great. Dirac won a Nobel Prize, of course. And uh, he had this wonderful metaphor for explaining the, the symmetry why matter and antimatter always come in pairs and why they always annihilate. And, and it's not exactly accurate, this picture. We have a much more nuanced picture today, but I really like this picture because it's so visual, it's so compelling to me, and it gives you a sense of why matter and antimatter, like, again, I keep saying, are symmetric, are paired up. And the visual is, uh, we're familiar by now with things uh, called quantum energy states, where you can have certain energy levels in the universe. You have your ground state, and then you have energy level number one, energy level number two, energy level number three, four, five, six, on and on and on above that ground state. And you can put particles, say electrons, we'll stick to electrons and positrons just to keep things simple. Uh, electrons down here, and, and some might go in the ground state, but because of various quantum mechanical rules, you can only fit so many electrons in that ground state. So you put some more in those, the new ones can't fit in the ground state. So they go in level one, you put some more in, they go in level two, you put some more in, they go in level three, level four, and you can, you can give energy to any of these electrons. So you can pluck them up they might go up to a really high energy level for a while and then they'll settle back down. And when they, and so if you give hit one with like a bit of light, like 
lightning bolt hitting an electron, gets a lot of energy, jumps up, hangs out out here. You can't even see that. It's above the camera. I'll put it there. There. Hangs out up here for a while and then gets bored and comes back down, releases some energy in the form of light. Normal quantum mechanical systems that we all know and love. And these energy levels technically go all the way up to infinity. If you gave a particle, an electron, an infinite amount of energy, it would jump to an infinitely high energy level. Okay. And it starts at the ground state. What if there's something below the ground state? What if there's an underground state, a basement state, an energy level negative one? It's not here at the ground level, but it's down here. And what if there's an energy level below that? Energy level negative two, and negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, all the way down to negative infinity. Just as there's an infinite number of positive energy states, what if there's an infinite number of negative energy states? Well, our electrons are little buddies that we like to pile in. They like to get as low as possible. They would all love to be in this ground state, but there's no room for them. Oh, but there's states below it down there. So they, they can percolate down. They go down. They go down. What if what we call the ground state, the lowest energy state in, in, the, in a system really sits on top of an infinite sea of electrons. What if these electrons in the negative energy states go from negative one, negative two, negative three, all the way to negative infinity, and there's an infinite number of electrons there, and they've, the reason electrons don't go any further below the ground state is all the states below it, all the subterranean states are already full. What would this mean? What are the consequences of this little little thought experiment? Well, what if you were to take, you're, you're looking down here like, wow, there's a lot of electrons down there in the negative energy C. Wow. This is called the Dirac C, by the way. Oh, wow. Look at all those electrons. I wonder what if I gave them some energy. What if I shot a beam of light, pew, lightning bolt, down to one of those negative energy electrons? What would it do? Well, it'd pop up, wouldn't it? So you shoot your lightning bolt, pew, hits an electron, way down there in the negative energy C, gets promoted. Now it's floating here in the positive energy world. And what does it do? Well, it's just an electron. It's not that special. You know, it might hook up with an atom for a while, you know, might form a covalent bond, you know, after a couple drinks, you know, like it does normal electron stuff up here. But what's down there? Well, there's a hole, right? Because you plucked, you gave some energy, you took one of those electrons out and you put up up here. Now there's a little electron sized hole down there. There's a hole in the C. And what will that hole do as all the other electrons down there jostle around and do their thing? That hole will float around. It'll do its thing way down here, a little hole. And what does a hole in a sea of electrons look like? Well, it has the mass of an electron because, you know, you took that mass up. It has the spin of an electron, but it has the opposite charge. It's a positron. In the Dirac picture, a, what we call a positron, the antimatter partner of an electron, is really the a hole in this negative energy sea of electrons below the ground state. And this is how you can get develop an intuitive picture of why a beam of light can split into an electron and photon. It's not splitting. You're hitting an electron in the below energy C. It gets promoted. Now you have an electron up here and a hole down here. You have your electron, your, your positron. Eventually, this electron gets bored of being up here. Man, this is exhausting. Uh, you know, it's too busy up here and falls back down fills up the hole, the electron and positron lose their identities, and that process releases a little bit of energy in the form of light. I hope this visual metaphor is able to help you understand 
why matter and antimatter always come in pairs. Thank you so much for watching. Can't wait to see you again next week. Remember, you can go to patreon.com slash PMSR to keep these shows going, of course. And like, share, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff. You know exactly what to do. You're a pro. Thanks.